practice listening test for IELTS, version 7, test 7. Instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You are going to listen to a talk about the library. Look at questions 1 to 11. Now listen to the talk and answer questions 1 to 11. Good morning everyone and welcome to our library. The library was opened in October 1975 and lies on the western side of the campus. It has seats for 630 readers and serves all the schools of studies which are located on the main campus. There is a branch on the library of the management centre which covers the works appropriate to management and business studies. The library has a stock of about 400,000 volumes, including some 63,000 volumes of journals and periodicals. You will be able to borrow up to 12 books at any one time, the normal loan period being eight weeks. To give all students an equal opportunity to read those books, for which there is a heavy demand, the library holds multiple copies of some titles. There is also a quick service collection which contains the books most heavily in demand. You can study these books in the library or can borrow them overnight or over a weekend. There are certain categories of books including the general reference collection which you can only consult in the library. The library subscribes to around 2,900 periodicals and current issues of most titles are shelved on special display racks. You can borrow periodicals either for two days or overnight, but current issues are all indexing and almanacs are restricted to use in the library. Because of the detailed and specialised nature of postgraduate work, you may need to consult material, which is not held by the library. Since no library can now be self-sufficient, given the rapidly increasing rate of publication throughout the world, the library enables you to obtain books and periodicals from other libraries. Through the interlibrary loan system you can have access to almost every major collection in this country and to many abroad. The library does not actively collect early or rare books but several important items have been bought, generously given or deposited on permanent loan. There are collections on the history of pharmacy, dyeing and local history and some first editions of J.B. Priestley's works. These can all be consulted in the library. Books and periodicals are not the only vehicle for the storage and retrieval of information and the library maintains a collection of other resources which are available for your use. We have the Self Access Language Centre. It's on the second floor, directly opposite the reference section of the library, next to the micro lab. In the Self Access Centre, the library also provides access to information stored in computer dating banks in Europe and the United States. Other materials which are kept by the library and which you will be able to consult are copies of these and dissertations completed by Bradford students, past examination papers, newspapers and pamphlets. All these are in our reserve section opposite the computer room on the second floor as well. The proliferation of books, periodicals and all other forms of information available through the library makes the keys to this information an essential part of the library's services. The library maintains a catalogue of its own books and a printed list of its periodicals. 
It takes most of the important abstracting journals and has a collection of bibliographies and guides to the literature of various subjects. There is a computerised information service known as Libine, which provides information on the library and its services and which can be accessed both in the library and via the university's commuter network. That is the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a conversation between a librarian and an applicant. As you listen to the conversation, answer questions 12 to 15. Look at questions 12 to 15. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 12 to 15. Good morning, sir. Good morning. May I help you? Yes, I'd like to get some information about this library. Who can join the library? Teachers of English, postgraduate and final year undergraduate, university students and professionals may apply for membership. I see. How can I apply for membership? Well, first, please fill in a library application form and put it in the box on the librarian's desk. Please make sure that you fill in the labels attached to the application form accurately. We will mail the application form to you at your work unit. Then you must bring the application form which your work unit has stamped and your work card with you in person to the library. At this time, you will be required to pay your library fee and you will be given your library tickets. Is it free for the ticket? I'm sorry, it's not free. It costs 10 yuan for Chinese and 50 yuan for foreigners for a one-year membership. The fee is not refundable and it will have to be paid annually. Well, after one year, shall I have to reapply for library membership? Yes, you will have to. I see. What shall I bring when I come to pick up the library card? Please bring your student and work card. Other ID won't be accepted. Your stamp application form too. Oh, one more important thing is that library application forms which are not picked up within one month will be discarded and you have to reapply. I understand. How many books and cassettes can I borrow at one time? You may borrow three items at one time, books or cassettes. If a book and a cassette is a set, it counts as one item. Items must be returned within one month. Can I telephone a library to renew items for another month? Yes, you can. When you ring us to renew books, please give us your name and the first word of the title of the book, cassette or video. Please remember that you are allowed to renew only once. I see. Just now you said videos could be borrowed as well. Yes, that's right. How many videos can I borrow at a time? You may borrow one video at a time. The video must be returned in a week. Oh, only one week? Yes. If you cannot return it on time, please call or otherwise your video library card will be revoked. You are not permitted to borrow feature films. The feature films can only be watched in the library. Oh, I see. Feature films cannot be borrowed. But where can I watch them? In the library. You must first register in person at the desk. You cannot register for someone else. If the library is busy, you are restricted to watching one video. If you have any problems with this machine, please inform the librarian. All right. Thank you very much. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You are going to hear a talk about computer development. Look at questions 16 to 25. Now listen to the talk and fill in the form and answer the questions. The earliest form of computer was being used over 2,000 years ago and even today it is still being used in some eastern countries. It is the simple abacus that you may have used when you were in the infant school. In 1642 a real development in computers came when Blaise Pascal invented the first adding machine. 29 years later Gottfried von Liebensert developed a calculator that could both multiply and divide, the world's first working computer. The analytical engine was designed by Charles Babbage in 1834. Babbage believed that his machine could be taught to do mathematical tasks. The dream of a true computer, one that could solve any number of problems, was not realised until the 1930s. In Hitler's Germany, an obscure young engineer named Konrad Zuse built a simple computer that could perform a variety of tasks. Its descendants calculated wing designs for the German aircraft industry during World War II. At Bell Telephone Laboratories in the US, the research arm of AT&T, a mathematician named George Sibitz, built a similar device in 1939 and even showed how it could do calculations over telephone wires. This was the first display of remote data processing. During the war, a British group, putting into practice some of the ideas of their brilliant countryman Alan Turning, built a computer called Colossus I that helped break German military codes. The British, German and US machines all shared a common characteristic. They were the first computers to use the binary system of numbers, the standard internal language of today's digital computers. By the end of the war, computers were developing quickly. In 1946, the world's first valve computer, ANIALC, was built. ANIALC vastly increased computer speed by using vacuum tubes rather than electromechanical relays as its switches but it still had a major shortcoming. To perform different operations, it had to be manually rewired, like an old wire and plug telephone switchboard, a task that could take several days. In 1947, three scientists at Bell Labs invented a tiny, deceptively simple device called the transistor, short for transfer resistance. For a long time, however, Computers were large and complicated machines that only governments and large companies could afford to operate. Then in the 1960s, scientists developed the integrated circuit. From then on, circuit designs could be printed onto a small piece of silicon chip. Computers could become much smaller and cheaper and thus available to everyone. Today, they are commonplace in business, schools and homes. In fact, one in every six homes in Britain has a computer. That's the end of section three. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You're going to listen to a lecture about sea animals. Look at questions 26 to 42.
Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 26 to 42. I'd like to welcome Dr. White to our series of lectures on biology. This is the most popular lecture we have had all year. Thank you. Today I'd like to talk about sea animals. We all know the sea occupies a greater area of the Earth's surface than the land. It is the home of millions of living. Animals and plants of the sea have various shapes, colours and sizes. Do you know that there is more life in the sea than on land? The animals and plants of the sea are very important to man as a source of food. Sea animals such as lobsters, crabs, fish and many shellfish can be eaten. Some sea plants, like seaweed, are also used as food. Animals in the sea range from tiny, one-celled animals to huge mammals. The most well-known of all sea animals are the fish. The majority of fish live in the shallow parts of the sea. Even among the fish, there are great differences in colour, size and shape. The smallest fish, the goby, is only one and a half centimetres long, while the largest fish, the whale shark, is over 15 metres long. The weight of fish can range from a few grams to about 900 kilograms. Most fish only live for a few months to a year. Although fish are so different, they have certain common features. All of them have special organs that help them to live in water. These special organs are fins and gills. The fins help the fish to swim in water. They also help the fish to steady and steer itself as it moves through the water. The gills are comb-like structures on either side of its head. The fish breathes by swallowing water and passing the water over the gills. The gills absorb the oxygen from the water. The water then comes out of the openings on the side of its head. These openings have covers, called gill covers, over them. Most fish also have air bladders. These help the fish to float. All fish have a line on either side of their bodies. It is called the lateral line and is used to detect sound vibrations and changes in water pressure. All living things, whether they live on land or in the sea, must fight to stay alive, that is, to survive. Each plant and each animal has to feed on something and at the same time avoid being eaten. Therefore, every plant and animal has to solve this big problem of staying alive in its own way. The danger of being eaten in the sea is great. Those plants and animals that do survive usually reproduce very fast and in great numbers. The single cell plant, the diatom, can multiply itself into a billion new diatoms in one month. Certain sea animals have defense and devices that help them to survive. Sea urchins, for example, grow spines to protect themselves. The sea anemone and jellyfish have poisonous tentacles, which are used for attack and defence. Another method of survival, which sea plants and animals use, is to disguise or camouflage. They usually have the same colour as their surroundings. The sargassum fish looks very much like the sargassum seaweed, among which it lives. Sharks can hide themselves because of their colouring. They are dark on top and silver on the underside and look like the colour of the water in which they live. In order to stay alive, animals need to have keen senses. Fish and some shellfish have sharp eyes. Almost all animals are sensitive to touch. Fish detect movements in the water by means of their lateral lines. Fish and other sea animals can hear well and many of them can make different types of warning sounds. In the future, you will be hearing more and more about the sea. It is one of the last training places on Earth which has not been fully explored by men. Today, more and more scientists are exploring the sea. This is because the population of the Earth is increasing so fast that very soon the land alone will not be able to provide enough food for everybody. That is why man is turning to the sea. It is like a huge storehouse. It contains not only food, also many other valuable things such as oil and minerals. The sea can also provide us with a lot of fresh water.
That's the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.